Good evening, everybody. Good afternoon. I wonder if you could, I could ask you to take your seats. Let me start by introducing myself. My name is Guy Orpen. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Bristol, and it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to the University of Bristol as the proud host of this afternoon's events. Let me say how extremely delighted the University of Bristol is to be participating in this launch event and indeed in all the events of the European Green Capital Year 2015 in Bristol. Um, the University of Bristol is a, a key strategic partner in that event for a whole host of reasons and we, key, we, we expect to be an active participant in many of the events and particularly in creating the legacy that we expect of the 2015 European Green Capital Year in Bristol. Um, so uh, by way of exemplifying the sorts of contributions we will expect to make, we expect to have 100,000 hours of volunteering from our student body and our staff body, but it'll mainly be our students. Uh, we expect to commit and deliver on our commitments to continuing reform of the ways in which we conduct our business as an organization, driving down our uh, ecological footprint, our energy use, and in all sorts of ways becoming a more sustainable organization. And we expect to be an active participant in the debate and dialogue around the formulation of policy, the role of research, of evidence, of innovation, and perhaps most of all of the people that enable us to develop the sustainable urban living that is at the very heart of the 2015 uh, agenda. We will also do our part to share the news that the, tw the 2015 European Green Capital events and activities are taking place in Bristol in a most obvious way by lighting the front of this emblematic building green. When the sun is set, we will see this building green and further down the road, our, the tower of our Wills Memorial Building will be lit green this evening and indeed every evening throughout the rest of the year to remind the citizens, to remind ourselves of what we're trying to achieve this year. Um, as I say, this is a huge opportunity for our staff and our students and our institution to be part of Bristol 2015, to engineer and deliver on the, the move to sustainable urban living and to set Bristol as an exemplar city that is both healthy and happy in the way it does its business. So rather than spend more time rehearsing that, I have nothing further to say except to wish you all an enjoyable opening weekend, an enjoyable and, and productive 2015, and to hand over to my colleague Laura Rollings from BBC Radio Bristol to compare the rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much and welcome. Thanks very much, Guy. Well, hello to you all. It's really good to see you this afternoon. Thank you so much for coming. Last weekend, I decided to do something that I've never actually done before. I joined the City of Bristol Choir um, in a public sing-song. It was one of those days when they just let anyone in. And the first, uh, first song that they wanted us to sing was What a Wonderful World by Louis Armstrong, which was all right because I knew the tune. And the conductor looked out at several hundred faces, eager faces, a bit like today actually, and said, I want you to think of Bristol as the European green capital when you sing this song. And uh, it did make me smile, because I thought, blimey, Bristol green capital is already popping up in some of the most unexpected kind of places. And the city is only at the very beginning of its journey. Just imagine what it's gonna be like when it's in full swing. And that's what today is all about. So in terms of how it's gonna work this afternoon, we're gonna begin by talking about the big picture first and also some of Bristol's goals. And then in the second part, we're gonna talk about Bristol as European green capital and discuss what's in store for 2015. Um, there will also be an important comfort break and tea and coffee as well, so don't worry about that. Now in my role as breakfast presenter, I've actually quizzed several key people um, who you're going to hear from. But today, on this big moment in Bristol's history, I've promised that the only time I'm going to interrupt is if they talk for too long. So let's see how we go. And please give a big welcome to the man who's gonna have to turn his red trousers green, Bristol's mayor, it's George Ferguson.
Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Guy. Thank you, Guy, for um, enabling us to host this event here. We have a wonderful relationship with both our universities who are playing a huge part in European Green Capital, and uh, I really value the fact that this is such a partnership of so many organisations across the city. But um, I, my, those people who organise my life insist that I am very organised with this and that I finish this on time, so forgive me, I'm going to be more formal than I sometimes am, and uh, I'm not going to risk uh, leaving out uh, essential names because there are so many people who have got us to where we are, many who I'm delighted to be able to welcome today. Uh, Carl Falkenberg, Director General of the Environment at the European Commission, who without whom we wouldn't have European Green Capital and we wouldn't be European Green Capital. Carl, you are an absolute master of making quite sure that what you believe in happens across Europe. And Bristol is proud to be not just European Green Capital, but to be a European city. Thank you. I would like to welcome the mayors of the former and future Green Capitals, Morton Cable from Copenhagen, who's become such a good friend and who has shared so much of what Copenhagen has done, and Mayor Zoran Janovic from Ljubljana, who will be taking over next year, and is obviously going to be watching us with great interest, and uh, his vice mayor, Chasa Fisco, who is... Uh, uh, has been at many of the events that have led up to this, and we've sat it next to each other in competition um, uh, for, the, for this, but they are there next year, and I celebrate it. Uh, Guizo Morales, the ambassador of Nicaragua, who is a great fair trade champion and, uh, a delight and a delight. Thank you so much for being here, Guizel. We, we really appreciate you taking the trouble. Annalisa Boni, Secretary General of Eurocities, who we meet on the environmental energy circuit so often, and representatives from many other cities in the Green Capital Network and other, and other networks across Europe, including from Nantes, Umea in Sweden, Cascais in Portugal, and Pex in Hungary. You're welcome, and the many others that I'm sorry that uh, I'm not naming. Bristol is European green capital because of so many people. Most of you here have played a part in some way or other of getting us here. And I would just like to start by thanking a few. First of all, the people of Bristol who have made this special city what it is, and that is all the people of Bristol. Shakespeare said, the people are the city. And that is so true. It's not the fabric, it is the people, and the people of Bristol are very speci special. The previous administrations of Bristol City Council. I'd particularly like to thank Baroness Yank, who kick-started this whole initiative, Councillor Helen Holland and Councillor Simon Cook, who both led bids as Bristol showed cross-party support and persistence. We tried three times, as Ljubljana did, you have to be persistent to win these things. I would like to ch thank the, the chairs of Bristol Green Capital Partnership that started with Alistair Sorday and now um, has uh, had Martin Big and now Liz Seidler and the many individuals of organisations who have worked to make that partnership into the UK's largest city environmental partnership. And I, I would dare to say probably one of the largest in Europe. I'd like to thank the European Environment Commission for creating the award, for encouraging us, and after the third time of trying, honouring us. A special thanks to the former commissioner, Yanis Potochnik, who was so supportive of this award. Copenhagen and former European Green Capitals for building the award to this point. Um, we have such wonderful cities that have gone before, before us that give us such pressure to do the right thing. When we won this award, I set out a very ambitious programme and sought unprecedented levels of support from the UK government and from, com from commercial partners. I'm delighted to say 
that they have responded magnificently and we have been able to create what I believe to be the best program to date. But I'm sure that uh, Morton will be challenging me on that. So I, I particularly like to thank, not something I do every day, I particularly like to thank the UK government for investing in Bristol and making it possible for us to showcase the UK's leadership in the green business and other fields. I particularly like to thank the Prime Minister for his personal support for this initiative, a clear advantage of having a direct line to number 10. I thank Danny Alexander, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury, who was instrumental in helping to secure the funds and who apologises for not being able to be here. We talked last week, but has sent us a video message because there has been a recall of Parliament or a, a necessary, and he's also had to go to Paris, which is a shame. I would like to thank all our commercial partners, in particular our Tier 1 sponsors, that is the really big major sponsors. We've got many, many sponsors, but if you forgive me the others, I will single out KPMG, Skanska and First Group, all of them making a very major contribution in both cash and kind. I was delighted when Bristol's key public transport provider First joined this initiative. As a result of the measures I'm taking, together with last year's Fair Affairs initiative, bus passengers have risen by 20% in number, and they are adding 12 new hybrid vehicles to the fleet, as well as introducing 40 new low-emission buses, all their whole fleet to be branded from today or yesterday as European Green Capital. So look out for them. Thank you first. Good public transport is critical to the city and requires some tough decisions, as you may have seen um, the, the, the signs of outside. But as an architect, I also know how important it is to create energy-efficient buildings. Skanska have demonstrated that the benefits of green buildings go far beyond financial savings. There's also a very positive effect on the people who occupy them, including the many, many school children in this city who now occupy new schools that have been built for us in Bristol by Skanska. We also need to plan for the future, so I was delighted when KPMG, one of the leading firms in Bristol's very strong professional services sector, became a key partner. During this year, they'll be working with us to develop the Bristol Method. This is a toolkit that any city around the world can use to become a more sustainable place, as well as developing clear plans to fund and deliver ma major new projects in Bristol, creating a real 2015 legacy for the city. For whatever we do this year, it's the legacy that really counts. And all these three are going to contribute to that legacy as will our other commercial partners. And we're looking forward to working together with all our sponsors and inspiring other cities to follow our lead. And finally, to all of you who have helped make Bristol the UK's greenest city, but also will work throughout 2015 and beyond to make Bristol a truly sustainable European city. So, Today you will hear a few of the reasons why Bristol is the European Green Capital and you will hear some of the excitements of the 2015 programme. I would like to set some context and say a little more about my ambition for the year. Bristol has for generations been a small global city, I think an ideal sized city, sharing ideas and creating change across the world. This year we have a unique opportunity to once again contribute internationally as well as locally. I would like to focus on how we are bridging the gap. Remember that term, bridging the gap, bridging between what we know we need to do to ensure a safe climate and the action we're taking in everyday decisions and in individual homes across the city. The UK was the first country to adopt statutory climate targets. Bristol, as the European Green Capital 2015, will work closely with the UK government, of whatever colour, and with other cities 
from around the world. Not least with the family of Rockefeller resilient cities of which we're a founder member to support the creation of a meaningful global climate agreement in Paris at the end of the year. Bristol will be building the messages that, we'll share, that we will share in Paris in two key events, the Youth Summit in late April and the World Parliament of Mayors um, and, and the City Leaders Summit in late October, both to happen in Bristol. Our sister green capital cities, Copenhagen and Ljubljana, being represented here, are already acting to cut their carbon emissions, and we all need to be empowered by our governments to act. Not in 2020, when the next global climate agreement will start, but now. During the Lima climate talks last month, disappointing in many ways, Bristol became the first UK city to join the Eclay Carbon Registry, part of a global United Nations carbon reporting process, allowing everyone to see our progress towards our carbon reduction targets. It is vitally important that we are transparent in what we do. We learn from our mistakes more than we learn from our successes. And I think it is the duty of every environmental city and of every European green capital to be absolutely honest about its achievements and to make quite sure that it's also honest about its failures. I've reaffirmed my commitment to our ambitious carbon and energy targets to reduce carbon emissions by 40% between 2005, the base date, and 2020. I'm delighted to be able to announce today that we lead by example and that the City Council itself has cut its own emissions by 30% since 2005 and are heading to achieve our own 2020 target this year. That's five years early. But there's much more to do and right across all sectors, across the city and beyond. At the annual West of England Carbon Challenge Awards, we saw businesses large and small demonstrating leadership by taking action on their own energy and carbon emissions. I'm also delighted that one of those collecting an award was Burgess Salmon, one of our Bristol 2015 commercial partners that is doing so much to help. And I'm even more delighted to see that Thanks to the support from our growing group of 2015 commercial partners, we're able to run what we call the Go Green programme this year, giving many more businesses and organisations across Bristol and the west of England the chance to green their businesses. You'll hear more about this later today. As a city, not only do we have a responsibility to the future and to the world to live within the Earth's means, but we also have a duty to the people of Bristol who currently struggle to heat their homes and will find it harder still in the future as energy prices are bound to bump up again. It's encouraging to know that over 75% of people want to take action to cut their energy use, whether this is save money or to cut carbon, but it's not always easy and we need to help people to bridge the gap. I'm therefore very happy that we are tackling this with the Warm Up Bristol programme, which is helping people to cut their fuel bills, especially on days like today, which was pretty parky cycling in to work. Thanks to strong support from the Department of Energy and Climate Change, we've been able to create the UK's largest home energy efficiency programme, and it's proving very popular with households. And I'm also able to announce today that since launching in October, householders have already signed up contracts for a million pounds worth of work. Warm Up Bristol is just one example of both partnership and innovation. We developed this project thanks to funding from the European Investment Bank. The UK government is supporting delivery of the programme with funding of over 7 million. That's a separate 7 million to the 7 million for green capital. And we have strong commercial partners. Our pioneering community energy groups are playing a key role in, help, in helping to reach the householders. And I'm delighted that we're implementing the project with the help of local businesses and builders, many of whom I've met. I've been insistent that our programme for 2015 is for the benefit 
of the whole of Bristol. That we will tackle fuel poverty in the, in the older housing areas and air pollution in the inner city areas. We will engage citizens in the outer suburbs and we will share the major events of 2015 with people ac across the wider region beyond Bristol. I've been insistent that our programme for 2015 is for everybody. Our work to green the city cannot on its own tackle all the economic and social issues of the city, but I'm determined that it will play a key role and bring jobs with it. So looking forward, 2015 is an exciting year for Bristol and I want us all to enjoy it, especially our young people. And, it's, and for them, it is the long-term impacts that are most important. I've been pressed by my youth mayors on this front and willingly take up the challenge for the young people. I want to accelerate the work we're already doing, such as my citywide tree planting scheme for primary school children, and to start new projects and initiatives which transform the city. That is why I set such high ambitions. I know that many of you share these ambitions. Some of these we shall meet this year, but most will be met in the coming years. And I know that by working together, by focusing on what we can achieve, we shall make the most of this year for the long-term benefit of Bristol. I'm proposing in my budget to create a Bristol European Green Capital Legacy Fund with a further 500,000, which will, I hope with match funding, get through Council on the 17th of February, help to ensure long-term community-led projects. However, I want to go much further. I want 2015 to be the start of a new tra trajectory for the future of Bristol, to help create a truly sustainable city. This trajectory will help us to bridge the gap between where we collectively know we need to reach and where we are now. Barra McRory, my director of a place, will flesh this out later. Government is playing its part on top of the funding for green capital with investment in energy and transport projects. Only last week, Baroness Kramer came down to announce another million for a pilot of hybrid diesel electric buses which were designed to improve air quality in the city centre. Green capital status has undoubtedly influenced major energy funding and will hopefully lead to further investment by government and Europe in Bristol. So as we open this year of Bristol as European green capital, I know that we will work together to celebrate what we have achieved and to achieve even greater success for Bristol and beyond. And I would now like to invite the godfather of European green capitals, Carl Falkenberg, Director General of Environment of the European Commission, to share with us his thoughts on Bristol as European green capital. Thank you. Thank you, dear George, uh, for the, the lot of praise that I, that I heard. Thank you for another fighting spirit, uh, convincing presentation about uh, why Bristol was chosen as green capital. I think listening to you was just another confirmation of the good choice that uh, the jury has made. Uh, thank you for the university to hosting this event. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to being here to the launch uh, of this new additional green capital year. Uh, Bristol is the first uh, in the UK. Uh, is following, as George Ferguson has said, a number of very competitive, prestigious uh, cities uh, from Stockholm to Hamburg to Vitoria Gasteiz to Nantes uh, to Copenhagen. The cities are all different, but they are all one thing in common. They have understood that uh, cities have to be organized in a sustainable manner, and they are all forming part of a European, a growing European family. 
It's so good to see so many of you here, so many faces that uh, do come back, either because they're not giving up on competing to eventually winning this award, um, or joining it because they have been convinced that this is worth an effort. For me, what is interesting in, uh, <clears throat> in this particular award is that this is the European Union not regulating, not directing, not telling how the municipalities have to be organized, but to looking out there, to seeing the many different approaches uh, that uh, the different uh, cities, municipalities have come up with. The fact that this is not just uh, an idea of some technocrats uh, in Brussels, but that this is something that is part of uh, the European life, something that we have in common. We all do need clean air. We all need uh, public transport possibilities because otherwise our cities are beginning to be immobile cities and we all do appreciate mobility in our lives. But it has to be mobility that is uh, in line with environment. We are looking for proper jobs, uh, certainly, but we need to make sure that uh, our jobs cannot be created against the environment. Because if we do that, as sometimes we have in the past, uh, we are leading ourselves into a fairly solid brick wall. And Europe is just beginning, hopefully, to come out of one of those economic crises. Uh, and I hope that one of the lessons would be that uh, we can't just repair what has led us into that brick wall, but let's use a crisis to construct something that is a little bit more sustainable. That's the spirit with which uh, we have picked up the idea uh, of a mayor in Riga who has contacted us many years ago and said, why don't we create a competition between cities to see how one can organize uh, life in a more sustainable, more environmentally conscious manner. And that is a very, very fundamental issue because 70% uh, of Europeans are living in cities today. What does it mean? It means that we are working, consuming, wasting, emitting in cities, and cities therefore tend to be hot spots of all sorts of environmental problems. If we can find a way of sharing best practices, how we can reduce those negative impacts that are created by so many of us, uh, living together in confined city areas, then I think we're doing a lot of positive to the overall environmental situation in Europe. And in order to create this link uh, and giving some better understanding for the, the width of the challenge that we're facing, I want you to imagine for just uh, 10 seconds the European flag, a blue flag with a lot of stars. Don't know how many of you have ever counted the stars on the European flag. I can tell you there's 12 of them. And there's 12 challenges that the European green capital has to meet. Each one of those stars on the European flag stands for one environmental challenge. It can be noise handling, it can be energy production or energy efficiency, it can be green areas, it can be the transport system, the way in which we use our water resources or deal with wastewater or waste more generally, uh, the way in which we create green employment, green jobs, the way in which we administer in a participatory way, uh, our cities, because that too is part of proper environment. It is only if our citizens are participating 
if they are convinced that this is the way to go, if they can bring in their ideas into proper sustainable city management that we can really recognize a title of green capital and use the city as a lighthouse for a year of recognizing uh, the city's value. This year, Bristol is the lighthouse in Europe, and I'm sure Bristol is going to shine very, very bright. Uh, the, the way in which the team has presented the city, its achievements, has documented uh, evidence of uh, reducing emissions, of handling the 12 different challenges, have really been convincing. And I think there are many other cities in Europe that ca can and will learn throughout this year of how cities can be environmentally managed. And I think that is what we want. But we also recognize that uh, an environmentally friendly, properly managed city is a livable city. I think these two notions have to be very closely together. Environment is not uh, a value per se. What we eventually need to move towards is sustainability. And sustainability is a notion with three pillars. There is an economic pillar. We do make sure, have to make sure that what we do is economically sound. It has a very important environmental pillar. We do need to make sure whatever we do is environmentally sound. And it has a social pillar because, as I said earlier, we need to take our people along and people need to have jobs, they need to have income, but they also need to have clean air, proper water, natural areas uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to cross, to walk through, to cycle through. Um, they need all this together. And therefore, it's a recognition. Green capital is a recognition for a holistic approach to those different uh, challenges. I think no one can win a green capital award if it's just good on one or two of these challenges. The lesson we've learned is that uh, environmental management requires holistic cross-border approaches. And I think Bristol stands for a lot of that. Now, it's not only the past. This award is not just recognition for achievement. It is also a commitment, a, prop, a promise into the future. And Georgia, I've said you want to create a fund I can share with you that uh, as other cities, we will make sure that in five years you are re-invited into one of the green capital ceremonies and we will give you an opportunity to explain how five years later your city is doing and what additional achievements uh, you have brought, you have realized. Because I think we need to build this in time. This is not just one moment of recognition, but it is a promise to continue to work in that direction. We need all to walk the talk, and not just to talk the talk. And um, as, uh, uh, as the European official in charge of this program, I have started uh, two years ago to pay tribute to the green capital by coming from Brussels to the capital in a sustainable manner on a bicycle. I promise I will do Brussels to Bristol this year and I will bring a couple of uh, colleagues with me to show that uh, these Eurocrats in Brussels uh, are also people who understand that uh, walking the talk or cycling the talk is important and cycling is such a good environmental way of moving from one place to another, not just in an urban environment, but we want to show that with a little bit of time it can be a lot of fun 
actually also cycling longer distance, and it doesn't always have to be a plane or a train or a car. So my congratulations one more time to, uh, to Bristol for all the achievements done, great expectation for sharing your experience throughout this year by so many activities that you have planned, and I'm sure that uh, I'll be back in Bristol, and I'm looking forward to celebrating this year with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Carl Falkenberg, the idea of Brussels to Bristol on a bike. I do hope you've got someone standing by to help you with any uh, sores you might acquire on the way. Um, also to George Ferguson as well. George, just picking up on one of the things that you mentioned, on the ability of the European green capital to really build on and also to accelerate projects and be fun and enjoyable. And I just want to mention um, one bus project that's doing that already, fondly known by many of you here, I'm sure, as the number two because it is powered by number twos. And I have to say, few other stories have quite captured the international attention and really put Bristol and Bath on the map in quite the same way. Um, I definitely won't forget talking about that news story on the radio as people ate their cornflakes and the uh, overwhelming number of puns that we received. I think I can leave them to your imagination. But um, just to go back for a moment, Bristol won the award in June 2013, and since then, a big team, I know many of you here today, have been working incredibly hard to make Bristol's year the largest and the most ambitious green capital yet. A key moment in planning this year was when the government confirmed its support for Bristol as the UK's first European green capital. And to mark the occasion, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, Danny Alexander, made an announcement at an event hosted by 2015 partner Burgess Salmon that the government would provide £7 million to support the year. Now, sadly, Danny can't be here today, um, but here's one he made earlier. Good afternoon. I'm really sorry that I can't be with you in person in Bristol today, but I hope you appreciate the fact that I'm sending this message using the greenest technology possible. And I'm absolutely delighted that Bristol secured uh, the title of European Green Capital and that you've made such a great job of planning uh, the programme. And my congratulations in particular uh, go to the Mayor, to Stephen Williams MP, and all those other people in Bristol who've worked so hard uh, to make this uh, a reality this year. Bristol has a great track record of embracing the future. In the 19th century, embraced the future and became one of the, the leading cities in, 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 in transport and the investments of, of those days. And once again, this year, Bristol is embracing the future, embracing green technologies, which are so important to the future of our economy in the United Kingdom. And a city uh, like Bristol in the world, which captures the idea that it is a uh, an, an innovative city, a green city, one that is pioneering in uh, low carbon uh, technologies, is a city that will secure for itself an enormous advantage, an enormous competitive advantage uh, in the world uh, economy today. So uh, I wish you uh, every success with the, uh, with the green capital. I hope that there is an opportunity to showcase what Bristol has to offer, as well as the 22,000 people in the West of England working in green in industries uh, have to offer. I hope that many people will participate and that the, the news of this will echo around the world as, as, a, as a beacon to others, as an inspiration to others, and perhaps other cities here in the United Kingdom and across Europe will see things from what Bristol is doing uh, that they can follow. I hope to get to Bristol in the next few weeks to take part in some of the events uh, around the Green Capital. But for now, I wish you a very, very successful day and a great year ahead. Thank you. So there we are, Chief Secretary of the Treasury, Danny Alexander, with his positive well wishes for Bristol. Now to the city that set itself the goal of being the best in the world for cyclists. And when I say that out loud, I can actually hear the intake of breath of car drivers across Bristol. Um, let's go to Copenhagen and its year as European Green Capital. Please can you show your appreciation for the Environment Mayor of Copenhagen, it's Mayor Morten Cabell.
thanks a lot, and good, eve, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a huge honor for me to stand before you and to be able to participate in this event. I'm very happy to participate in events of the European Green Capital Years because they are so important for us on, as a continent. The pledge that we give in running for Green Capital in each of our cities is an important one. Because these years, we can see that nations, they talk. The US Senate, a couple of days ago, actually voted that to acknowledge that climate change is real. They failed to acknowledge that it's man-made. 50-50. This shows that nations are good at talking, but cities are acting. And the environmental and climate challenges that we are acting upon are massive. But we, city, we as cities can actually help create a greener world. In Copenhagen, we are glad that we had the opportunity to be European Green Capital last year. I must also say that after seeing parts of this year's program that you in Bristol are taking on, I'm also glad that we didn't have to follow your act. It seems, I'm very certain of that, that you have a lot of interesting projects on the way. I sincerely hope that I'll have the chance to participate in some of them, but rest assured that Copenhagen will be following all of your projects closely. Because I look forward to the continued cooperation between our cities. The, the cooperation between cities are important because we have to learn from each other, we have to learn from each other's cha uh, challenges, visions, and of course, failures. Because as you mentioned, George, it's from the failures that we actually are learning. It's from the failures that we know how to move on. So we also need to share how we actually did wrong in each of our cities. Copenhagen has pledged to be carbon neutral in 2025. That's 10 years ahead of us. We have managed by now to reduce our carbon emissions by 45% comparing to 1995 levels. And I'm actually confident that through combined efforts and cooperations with other cities and throughout Copenhagen, we will make it. But we also know that we have a lot to learn from you. Hopefully you can also learn something from us. So in the style of a know-it-all uncle at a family gathering, I will try to dispense my wise advice from the dark regions of Scandinavia on how to be a green capital. Firstly, don't underestimate the power of partnerships, cooperation, and co-creation. When we started our program, we had a lot of ambitious ideas. And honestly, we were prepared to cut most of them simply because we didn't have the resources to execute them properly. After all, the Copenhagen City Council put in as much in, in, the, year as the, in the year's program in Danish krona than Hamburg did in euros. And for those of you not familiar with the exchange rates, then that's a factor of seven to one. Or should I say these days, what time is it? Uh, <laughs> But when we started examining the parties and interests involved in the projects, we found out that we didn't always have to put all the weight behind them. And sometimes it would be much better if we actually let go of the reins and let the projects unfold in the pace of the people involved. That opened up for a massive influx of companies, NGOs, grassroots, and citizens who actually wanted to lend a hand. We were delighted, and I must say also admittedly surprised at the level of interest and energy put into the projects by third-party energy agents. And in some instances, it also transformed our view of them as third parties. Because in fact, they were the ones affected and involved. So it made perfect sense to have them play a more active part than we would traditionally have done in an administrative organ with a, a sexy name as the Technical and Environmental Administration of the City of Copenhagen. Whew. 
But the lesson of cooperation is definitely something that we will carry with us in the future. I know that you are already attentive of this, for instance, through the Bristol Green Capital Partnerships. But this lesson would still be my first advice to you. Build and sustain partnerships. Not long ago, I participated in a debate in Copenhagen on architecture and infrastructure in coastal regions in regards to the so-called Nordic architectural model. I'd never heard of such before, but I learned something new that day. I'm not sure that there is any such thing as a Nordic model when it comes for sustainability. But let, 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 us, let, let us lie for now. Because one of the other panelists used a phrasing that I found very true. He said that we are always talking about getting people involved. Instead, we should probably talk about listening to them. Because when you try to get people involved, it's actually a very top-down way of thinking. We have the solutions. You, the common people, just have to get excited about our ideas. It almost has a ring to it that reminds me of the attitude towards democracy found a couple of centuries ago, that the simple folk, the peasants, the uneducated should simply follow the knowledgeable. This way of thinking is, of course, unavoidable by some uh, agents, but should be avoided when it comes to urban development. When we entered into partnerships, we found that through a strategy of true co-creation, our partners came up with better ideas that we could have done in the, in the city, and Copenhageners felt like they were part of the project to a much higher extent. I'm not saying that we always listened, or even that it was always helpful to listen, because sometimes a lot of the ideas were very contrary. But in listening, instead of commanding, is one of the ways that we can further a more democratic process. And I believe it is one of the ways that we can build the culture that is necessary to go beyond merely being sustainable. So the second lesson would be my second piece of advice, listen. Now my third piece of advice in, uh, lands in an area that you could say is a bit outside the territory of a modern administrative and political organ such as the one I represent. The program of more than 90 partnerships, 300 events, 100 visits from all over the world, and lots of parties in the streets of Copenhagen, and much more going on, we found that it put a tremendous strain on not just our organization, but also on us all as individuals. When we handed the title over to you guys from Bristol in December, a lot of people were tired and worn out. But we also had lots of fun. Because during this past year, we felt things move. We felt we made a difference. We were all in it together. We were all in it for good. And that rush that you get when things just work should not be underestimated, even when you're sleep deprived and work down to your boots. But when you, and when you suddenly have a tendency to forget your meeting material when rushing from one side of town to the other, so as I should also say to you, take good care of your mayor as well. But my third and final advice to you all would be, enjoy this year, have fun, because it is great and it is fun to be the European green capital. You will find out that people are enjoying visiting Bristol, seeing what you guys have to offer, and seeing, well, as I've seen myself through this, my only second visit, that you have lots to offer the rest of Europe and indeed the rest of the world. So work together, listen to your citizens, and have fun. Simple as that. End of story. And of course, I can allow myself to give you such abstract advice because I've seen the plans for this year. I've met many of you on several occasions. And I have, I must say, the utmost respect for you here in Bristol and the work that you've been doing in the environmental field. I know that you have things under control. And I have no doubt that we in Copenhagen, like the rest of Europe, will see impressive and inspirational things from your year as European Green Capital. As I said it once before, we were honestly afraid in Copenhagen 
that you guys would have snatched away the title of 2014 away from us under our noses. Fortunately, you didn't. But as I started by saying, I'm glad that we don't have to follow your act because it's a really great one. Just as I said, remember that it's all about people working together and it's all about enjoying the year. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Morton Cabell, our now favourite know-it-all uncle. Um, clearly a story in there about losing your reading material. Maybe when we get to the comfort break we can find out more. Um, onwards, though, to our next speaker, who I first met, actually, when I was in Bradford, and he was responsible for regeneration at a really key time in the city's development when it was facing quite a lot of challenges. And I can remember when he was appointed to Bristol City Council's management team and reading the press release that was issued, and it said that Barra has a great reputation for delivering good quality urban regeneration projects in a tough environment. And having hosted some pretty heated radio phone-ins in West Yorkshire, I thought, yeah, that sums it up pretty well. So please welcome to the stage our next guest, Barra McCrory. Hello, and thank you. Yes, I am Barra, uh, originally from West Yorkshire, with that accent. <laughs> That's the first one. A Dubliner in Europe, a citizen of Bristol, an Irishman in Britain, one of the many, and the city's strategic director of place. And that's place without an I. <laughs> I've been practicing that for weeks. <laughs> My brother-in-law gave me that one, actually. He's an entrepreneur, and he said, how did, you get an act how, did, how did you get a title like that? I have to explain. So I'm very proud of the small part that I've played in getting Bristol to this day, in helping the quiet and diligent determination of Nicola Yates and all those involved to secure the year ahead. I think 2015 will be really a long lever for the future, and it'll be great fun for the city. My role in the city is to help others succeed by working in partnership and by leading on the spatial, infrastructural, economic, cultural, physical and sustainable development of the city. From creation of the Bristol Energy Company to the building of transport infrastructure to planning for the future housing requirements of the city. This means that I can find myself moving between the poles of hero and villain. The walker's friend the cyclist's frustration, the driver's fury, or most often the complete reverse. One citizen's red light is another citizen's green. On the 9th of May, when the slide changes, thank you, Robert Schumann, the French foreign minister, said, Europe will not be made at once or according to a single plan. It will be built through concrete achievements, which first create a de facto solidarity. On that day, Robert Schumann proposed setting up with the coal and steel community. This put in place a common market between the six founding countries. The aim was to secure diplomatic economic stability between Europe's victorious and vanquished nations. In 1973, the UK, the Republic of Ireland, Denmark joined the European community. We have a bind. At the same time, new social and environmental policies were introduced and the European Regional Development Fund was set up in 1975. So economic, social and environmental policy has been at the heart of the European Union for 40 years. And they're also at the heart of the Council's many plans, many subjects and fields of work, from working with our economic sectors, to building schools, to supporting learning, to protecting the city from flooding and our most vulnerable. The City Council is committed to working and sharing knowledge with other cities around the world, whether being a Euro city or part of the UK core cities network or the Rockefeller 100 cities or the emerging Playable Cities Forum. The City Council is the second tier of UK government. Your local government has three primary roles. Firstly, community and city leadership via its democratic mandate. 
Secondly, it is a service provider, commissioner, enabler, challenger, and lastly, a regulator through its statutory duties and powers. Yet finding, measuring, weighing the balance between all of those roles, its subjects, its numerous funding streams, its partners, networks, the need to replace contracting funding is a challenge. However, it's a responsibility we do not seek to offset, and local government is quietly marching through massive, massive change. We want it to be the best for Bristol. So here we are, 65 years on, from the establishment of a coal and steel community, launching Bristol as the sixth European Green Capital, where at the heart of the award is the sharing of knowledge in order to achieve the good growth of the member economies. Robert Schumann talked about the need for concrete achievements, and it was the achievements of the many members of our city's Green Capital Partnership that delivered this great honour for the city. The many organisations, individuals, politicians from all groups from the Council, and for many years, all in that big green tent. That collective intent helped create the city which we now celebrate. The success was based on four key foundations. Firstly, Brisbane's Bristol residents live green lives. Bristol is one of the lowest producers of waste of any major UK city, and we're one of the highest recyclers. Over 50,000 residents are actively involved in green activities. Secondly, Bristol residents enjoy good access to nature and green space, with 90% living close to one of our 99 nature and conservation areas, our 400 parks and green spaces. Thirdly, Bristol residents are helping to green the economy, 8,000 people working in environmental technology and service sector in the city. And lastly, the city is investing in its future, £300 million in being invested in energy and transport policies. Huge, huge green talent exists in this city. And campaigning is at the grassroots of green. But so is peace. And we need to find that peace, that place between the economy our society and our environment. However we got here, we need to go to the next place again together, again in partnership, again in the tent, and again with that collective intent. At the heart of the future green place, the tension will inevitably rest between me, the individual, and we, our society, and how both relationships are held between the economic and environmental poles. The choices we then have to make, or are forced to make, is where the challenge lies. All of our acts have an effect. They are not all equal, and it's very hard to put that gluten genie back in the bottle. So we are, and we must remain, the considered custodians of this city. These are hard choices. They're hard choices for me, they're hard choices for my family, they're hard choices for all of us. But we, the council, are not perfect. Tensions exist in lots of policy areas, from Metrobus to Blue Finger, from residence parking to the desire to entirely commute short distances, from local shopping to hotel shopping to internet shopping, the list goes on. Crucially though, we cannot offset this responsibility for future generations to handle. All of our hands are on the wheel of this city. Growth is happening, there are more of us, we use more, we eat more, we want more, the population is increasing. How we, in our big, small city, find its place, its balance in that future ahead, is crucial. And this will be the Bristol way. This will be a great export. This we can trade. This can we can share. This will create jobs and economic purpose. I want to see the growth of a greater Bristol. A city of stability, of humanity, of quality, of knowledge, in order to realise the sustainable and thriving prosperity for a fairer, kinder, and more reciprocal society, which I hope we as Bristolians can continue to make. <coughs> Bristol Way must continue. We must fuse the best advancements of our technology to advance the quality of our minds, the fun of our hearts, the drive of our intent, without the degradation of people and the few hundred square kilometres of this planet that we are responsible for. Getting this right <coughs> is what I call setting our future trajectory. The city is built on many plans, but no one plan can encompass our total future. 
however we must set out this trajectory, having both quiet and loud conversations about the city's future ahead. So this year we will embark on creating a new trajectory for Bristol's future, a long view, one that builds on our success and responds to the current and future of challenges and opportunities. We will need to ask many questions as to how we will earn our living in the future and how we will wish to live. The trajectory will help us to aim this city into a future place, one which we can then all set sail for. It will be the North Star of this city. Onward and thank you. businesses and organisations that form the Green Capital Partnership and as you can see we're just uh, rearranging things on stage. In just a couple of moments time we are going to be joined by three of their members and also the partnership's chair so we'll just get seats out for everyone. Um, whilst that happens I can tell you that we are just 20 minutes away from having a break so if you're starting to feel a little bit uncomfortable there's good news. Uh, refreshments are available um, I'll tell you how you get them, but that's happening in just a short moment's time. Um, Liz, I can hand over to you, I think. Yes, clearly we've got props for this section, which is very exciting. <laughs> Liz, I will leave it to you to explain. The <laughs> partnership's nothing if not dynamic. And actually, we've grown from three to four members of the partnership, as well as myself. Thank you very much indeed, Laura. It's fantastic to be here. In fact, I've just been asked um, backstage if, if I'd given Morton a, a quick uh, a few Bristol pounds outside, because uh, he couldn't possibly have laid the foundations for what we wanted to talk about now better than talking about the importance of partnership, the importance of listening to your citizens, and the importance of fun. I think, I think we try and sum those three things up um, in everything that we do. So, so thank you for that, Morton. I, I promise to, to speak to you later. Um, uh, when I was sitting at the front, uh, and I had a little peer over my shoulder and looked around the room, and I thought, actually, in many ways, this room is in some senses like a reflection of the partnership and what we try to try to achieve with the partnership. This room is chock a block as far as I can see and as far as I know with incredible amounts of leadership, diverse leadership from all sorts of different sectors and from different backgrounds. Um, and, and that leadership involves an awful lot of wisdom and experience embodied in this room. It's, it's, it's humbling to be here in front of you today. Uh, and. And what I was thinking as I was sitting there is thinking, what actually might be possible, even today, if we had the time and the opportunity to do so, what might be possible if the government advisor who's probably sitting over there got to speak to the business person who might be sitting down the front here, who actually might connect up with, with a community leader that's sitting in the third or fourth row, who knows that an innovator or a social entrepreneur who's, who's probably sitting a bit more quietly at the back. What would happen if those guys got together and found out that they had a shared vision, they had a shared idea of something they wanted to achieve, and they all had different parts of that solution that they might be able to work together to achieve. But perhaps a little bit more excitingly, and this is where the partnership really does try and play a role, what, what would happen if we collectively all of that leadership in this room, all of that wisdom and experience in this room came together and tried to support those people in what they're trying to achieve, tried to help them build capacity to, do, to achieve what they wanted to do, and perhaps even supported them in terms of communication, in terms of funding, in terms of opportunities to make their dream into reality for this city. And perhaps what, what we also might be able to collectively do is work out how <coughs> all of the things that we're all trying to achieve, how they strategically fit together and how we can make sure that what they were trying to do to achieve their goals fitted into that bigger picture. So in some senses, I want to th us to think today about this leadership in this room as, as a reflection of what the partnership is all about. And I'm going to take us back in time a little bit because the partnership isn't a new body. There are a handful of, of very, very pioneering people with real insight, and many of them are in the room today, so I, I want to thank them, not in, by name, but I want to thank them for that, for that pioneering spirit. But back in 2007, they dared to dream. They dared to dream, or we should be proud and thankful to them for that dare. Dared to dream, what would it be like if Bristol was a green capital? And this is before Carl and his, his colleagues had set up a European Green Capital Award. What would happen if Bristol was a green capital, was a, a figurehead for other places to copy? How could we get from where we were to where we would need to be to be that green capital? 
By 2013, when we had the opportunity to stand in front of Carl and his colleagues and win that award, the partnership had grown from those few, that handful of pioneers in a room in 2007, it had grown to, had grown to about 250 or more members. And it was really gathering strength and was making an impact in lots of different ways across the city. And here we are today, it's 2015 and we are the European Green Capital and we're very, very excited to have played our part and I think the partnership did play a really important part in winning that title for the city. And thanks to the spotlight that the European Green Capital Award has brought to the city and an awful lot of hard work from many people in this room and beyond, we're now entering a new era of Bristol's Green Capital Partnership. We're now, I think, we're safe to say the biggest green city partnership in Europe, we hope, unless someone's going to correct us, but we're, we're going to claim that one anyway. Um, uh, we're over 750, I think I was told yesterday there were up to 759 different organisations, although it grows by the day, so it might be different today. Um, incredibly diverse, from huge organisations like the City Council itself and the universities, huge corporations, right the way through the spectrum to tiny little community groups of two or three people making a difference in their street and their neighbourhood. And it's that diversity, I think, that brings our strength. It's that diversity of leadership and inspiration and ideas. And we as a partnership are proud that we're able in different ways to support, to connect and to challenge the city, its businesses and its organisations to live up to that, that, that original dream of being a green capital. But of course, with those opportunities come challenges. Those challenges are important and they're real and they're here today. And the, and the Green Capital Partnership is working to prepare itself, to prepare ourselves as a collective representation of civic leadership. And I think that's what we are. We're preparing ourselves for the real work, the real work of legacy that's been touched on already today. How can we collectively support the city to really embed the change that has been happening and that is going to continue to happen this year? How can we embed it so that it's deeper, it's wider, it's right into the fabric of how this city works? How can we take on that challenge collectively? And as a partnership organisation, we're working hard to really reinvent and reinvigorate the Green Capital Partnership in Bristol to build a new incarnation, building on the momentum that this year is going to offer to create a really strong, independent legacy organisation that's able to have the really sustainable, I shouldn't fall over that one word, should I, but the sustainable, <laughs> robust governance and structures that will help to be able to be ready and able to give that kind of support that I talked about that we collectively might be able to give to each other in this room earlier on. How can we build capacity? How can we support the city to come together to deliver and, and, and develop and create a shared vision, a shared strategy that really, really draws people in. Those partnerships that Mark Morton talked about, listening to people to find better solutions for tomorrow's challenges. How can we play a part in collecting the city together in that way that, so that we can really realise our aims over the months and years to come? That's our challenge and we look forward to, to um, living up to it together with you. So I have the privilege I've hogged the limelight for a moment and I'm sure these guys will forgive me. I've got a huge privilege of sharing the stage today with just four of those organisations, of those 759 organisations, of four of those leaders that I said it was such an honour to, to chair um, earlier. Over 60% of the partnership is businesses, so we're going to start with business. Um, we're, we're lucky to have um, Stride Treglauen, a local architect firm who are one of the West of England Carbon Challenge Award winners that, that um, George referred to earlier. Robert Delius is the head of sustainable design for um, Stride Treglauen. So can you tell us a tiny bit, I've given them a horribly short amount of time, but a tiny bit of, to, about the amazing work that you do. Well, as architects, obviously our main impact is what we design. Um, and we've designed some um, very sustainable buildings in Bristol. Um, but it's actually, the, the phrase has been mentioned before, walk the talk. And so we, we do sustainability as a business, but we need to look at our own business. And that's what we've done. So we've reduced our carbon footprint by 39% over the last two years. And it's, it's not just about carbon and energy, it's also about the other things which count. And so we've created uh, mini allotments for staff at work. We've also uh, created a wildflower strip in front, of, in front of our office. And we've got three beehives now. Um, and we're hosting those for a local beekeeper. But one of the main things we've started, which was an idea which came out of staff, which is to have green weeks. And we've had four internal green weeks now. 
And it's a really powerful way of getting staff motivated and involved. And some of the ideas which have come out of that and some of the things we've done is, for example, we've converted our car park into um, a five-side football pitch, um, which has been very sure. popular. Um, and it was a vote to buy staff against some of the, the hardcore drivers who didn't want to do it. Um, need to learn from that, George. So, <laughs> Think things like that. We've also replanted our, our gardens at, at our work, and instead of uh, appointing someone else to do that, we've actually put had a plant on everyone's desk. It said, "Plant me." They went ahead and then did that. It's that whole kind of communal um, sh sharing experience, which has been really, re really rewarding. Fantastic. And and you've been long-term supporters and active in the partnership. What are your plans for the coming year? How are you getting involved in all of all of this activity? Well, um, what, something else we've um, set up is Business Green Week with Low Carbon Southwest and Business West, and we want to carry on that and encouraging others to do that. And one of the projects which we're looking at for this year is we're working with Bristol beekeepers to design a new facility for them. Has and you got bees in the box? <laughs> it's the big question. No, no, you're all right. You're all right. So we're, we're, um, we've been looking at... Um, the, the, the honeycomb sort of structure of, of, of bee, um, w which you get in a beehive. And um, we're creating this new facility with this sort of structure. And it's something that we want to actually build at our office beforehand as a sort of prototype, get the public involved, get staff, get students, and it just being another sort of shared experience. Brilliant. A fantastic example, I think you'll agree, of, of, of even smallish businesses being able to really inspire and make change across the board and inspire other businesses. The, the Business Green Week is really, really growing. Now, I'm going to move now to what an absolutely iconic part of Bristol's modern heritage, uh, the Bristol Pound. I hope you've got some wads of it. Yes, luckily he has. Um, uh, Bristol Pound is out there on the streets of Bristol, really, really challenging and changing people's thoughts and actions. So we're very, very pleased to have Steve Clark, one of the directors of Bristol Pound. Thank you. Can you give anyone, I'm sure there aren't many people here who don't know about the Bristol pound but anyone who doesn't just a real high level idea of what on earth it's all about yeah sure um, the Bristol pound is a local currency what that means is you spend it locally you spend it in local independent shops it comes in two types two forms loads there's, of money there's the, <laughs> there's the printed Bristol pounds which you can get out in the lobby actually after this uh, after this talk and there's a digital version which you run from your mobile phone um, in partnership with the credit union um, there's no, um, 900 um, local businesses now that uh, accept the Bristol Pound, and it's growing. It's fantastic. It's fun. Um, and you have been, again, have been involved with the partnership for a long time. I believe you've got yeah. some very early seed funding. What sort of benefits do you think has been from that partnership working that Morton was so strongly advocating earlier? Yeah, the partnership was was great in in a number of ways, really. I, I mean, they gave us um, some. A small amount of money which we did uh, a feasibility report with and which then led on to the business um, with 10 employees now so you know a small business but more than that it gave us um, support I mean printing your own money is kind of quite a sort of quirky idea and when you're sat there thinking you know can I do this am I allowed to do this and you talk to other members of the partnership and they say yeah go for it why not you know Bristol's that kind of place so we got loads of support and mentoring and help with specific skills from other members of the partnership. It was, um, it was great. Fantastic. And I believe you, you, you've got some exciting plans for this year. Can you really quickly summarise those? <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, well, a couple of things. Um, number one, this year is the year we're hoping to scale up. From this year, you'll be able to pay your council tax in Bristol, uh, in Bristol pounds. Uh, you know, what a great thing to do. Why not? Why wouldn't you do that? Um, you'll, there's a competition for new notes, a des new design for the notes, so go online and see what that's about. And we're helping um, about 28 other communities to start currencies. People love it. Um, we're not for profit, we just think it's a great idea and we're really supporting other people to do the same thing. It's fun. It's fun. <laughs> it is fun indeed and we are definitely becoming the global local currency 
capital. I mean, let's, let's stack up these capitals, I say. You know, why not? We'll definitely get, um, earn that one. Finally, we've got two groups um, here from, with both with very long histories of green innovation in the city, but also both members of our resource action group. The partnership has a whole range of different action groups of, of collections of people who work in different themes of, of, of greening our city, who come together to do some of that connecting that we talked about earlier. Um, and these are both members of that. We first have Sarah Callan from Bristol's Children's Scrap Store. Sarah, tell us a little bit about some of these fantastic bits and bobs you've got in front of you and what, and what they have to do with our green capital ambitions. Um, obviously from the picture you can see that our scrap can get pretty large and, and um, trying to get a scrap store play pod in here is probably not a good idea. Um, so I brought an example. Um, this was a school project. So this was a school girls rocket, which is, you know, you've got some ripstop nylon there, cans, cardboard tubes, Yo Valley yogurt pots that they don't use anymore. Um, and she also made a pod so she could take her pet dog with her. Um, this one is a cardboard kitchen and cardboard oven. So that's quite good with sort of preschool age children. Um, and also it's Chinese New Year, Children's Scrap Store working with the museum on Chinese New Year and we've fashioned a Chinese lantern out of Warrington postcards. <laughs> um, so we basically, we collect safe waste um, that's donated to us from business and industry. So anything from tiny, small little offcuts of paper foil right up to industrial con construction, tubing and foam. Um, over 150,000 children in Bristol and the surrounding areas play with scrap every year um, we are now on 200 play pods a play pod is like a giant toy box that goes into um, children pre primary school lunch times um, and that equates to about 54,993 children playing with scrap in their lunch times um, and the benefits of play you know it's it's fun it's well-being happiness for children um, but it's also creative it touches their imagination um, and it connects them with the world around them so schools are, are raving about play pods and over a quarter of those are in Bristol. Hopefully my daughter will be going to a, a play pod school. She'll be the 59,994. 94, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so scrap's always in my house. Um, but we also, we divert about 100 tonnes of waste uh, from landfill every year. Last year it was 140 tonnes. We're hoping that that will be about 5,000 tonnes by 2020. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. It's very, very inspiring stuff and brings together that, that green and that fun bit that we've been promising the, the world all the way along. And last but definitely not least, sorry to have left you till last, Ben. We have Ben Moss, who's a co-founder and director of Bristol Wood Recycling. We've almost got a kind of wood-themed suit on. I'm liking that little <laughs> subtle, subtle thing going. It's, 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 it's why I haven't look. moved yet. <laughs> Can you... <laughs> I need to oil you. No, that's, that's that, the tin no, no, man. No, yeah, yeah. Um, get, I'm get getting mixing my metaphors. Um, uh, ben, tell us a little bit about, the, the, about your fantastic project. Okay, so Bristol Wood Recycling Project in its 12th year now. We collect what would be waste, waste wood, so from construction, from households, from institutions. Last year we collected over 365 tonnes and we reused a quarter of that. So we're reusing, reimagining waste. And as a social enterprise, as a cooperative, we work with volunteers from all sorts of backgrounds and last year we had 880 volunteer days. And they're out in the van, they're in the yard denailing and they're in the workshop making stuff. So we're really taking what would be waste and what would be going to landfill and creating employment and products out of it. Perfect, perfect circular economy stuff. Now, one of the reasons we've got these two here out of those very, very many organisations that I mentioned is that, that within the resource um, action group, there's some, an interesting thing has emerged inspired by the European Green Capital Award and I hope um, supported by the partnership in many different ways. Can you tell us a little bit about that? One of you going first. Go to Ben first. So uh, we're, we're part of the Bristol Reuse Network and we're really trying to address some of the issues that, um, that were talked about earlier. George talked about needing to look after our, our planet and our resources and at the moment we're using three planets worth of resources. So really we need to reimagine the way that we use things. We need a future where everything is repairable, reusable or recyclable. And at the moment there's a great collection of, of businesses and social 
enterprises who deal with reuse here in Bristol, and we are working together collectively, collaboratively, co-creatively um, to actually address this issue. And really what we're looking at is behaviour change. We want behaviour change not only from consumers, so they're looking at resources in a different way, but also from the manufacturing end as well. There's something great, as, as Carl was talking about, from, um, from directors coming from above, but there's also something really powerful in organisations working from the grassroots, like the partnership has been, and addressing an issue collectively and collaboratively. And, and we think by working together, dealing with all of the different resources that we do, which is anything from wood to bicycles to food to clothes to furniture, that we can start to address the production and the consumption of these, these products so we can use our resources sustainably. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen how reuse can benefit our organisations, and so within the reuse network, it's not just about how we can help each other, but we also know the benefit of the wider Bristol community, how the Bristol public can benefit from understanding more about reuse and how that can improve life for everyone. And that, I think you'll agree, is a really fantastic example, not only of how the partnership can bring people together to, to achieve far more together than they would apart, but also how we're working closely with the, uh, the company, the Bristol 2015 company, because these guys have also got a grant from the 2015 company to, to enable that re reuse consortium to really, really flourish in the coming year. So I hope what we've just given you is a really little, very tiny microcosm of what what we're doing um, this year and to be honest with you every year and every year in the past and every year in the future it's a microcosm as well I think of what's possible when we do really embody that co-creation that listening that we heard about earlier we're co-creating a green capital together across our differences which is really important it's good that we have such diversity in this city on so many different levels and using our different strengths we're pooling our wisdom and our resources like I talked about at the beginning to create a bigger change together and to make sure that that change counts now, as you heard before, we'd be happy to hear that we're about to go for a tea break, and I wanted to leave you with a thought to ponder over your cup of tea. Um, could it be that actually this sort of really joined up representative civic leadership, working in partnership with the council, with the bodies across the city that make a difference, could this sort of joined up civic leadership be the real global edge that Bristol can offer to the world and could that be the real legacy of our European Green Capital Year. Enjoy your tea, have fun as we were told and thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>